History and philosophy. Each Cuban tribe was responsible for its own history and the state was responsible for the history of the nation. It was oral history. The oral historian, again, as in the case of all of the crafts, was a trained historian. The basic training was in mnemotechnical system. This training in memorization began as an apprentice to a recognized historian other than the principal the oral historian. There were special occasions for members of the clan to assemble to listen to the story of the clan and other occasions for the general community to assemble for the overall history of the nation. The absence of written history made the task of the oral historian very exacting. He was generally held so strictly accountable for any errors made in his account that at times the reaction to mistakes made, made seems to have been unreasonable. But while he was allowed the widest latitude and commentaries of his own and even in fantastical embellishments designed to shock his listeners or entertain them, he dared not err in reciting the factual data of history. It seems quite clear that not only the elders, who were also well versed in oral tradition, knew the difference between a mythical and a truly historical account, but the people also understood that what was intended as amusement and what was their real history. Aside from tall tales, the historian often used proverbs reflecting the philosophy of great leaders and that of, of the race, praise songs of great men and great events, songs which we would call the blues, which told of past failures and heartaches, and dances of victories won and of thanksgiving. But the assembled elders were always keeping a sharp watch out for any serious errors on the part of the oral history. He might be removed or even banished. In either case, his career would be ended in disgrace and his, his disgrace might wreck his life among his people. On the other hand, if successful, the rewards were great because the oral historian was the community's storehouse of wisdom and one of the most honored personalities. He was the core of the educational group. The lineage was the key to the history of the extending family, the tribe and the nation. Within the lineage were the social, religious, economic, and political ties that held together the family, tribe, and nation. Shyam the Great. Shyam the First was one of the greatest leaders that the black race ever produced. And considering the conditions and circumstances of his time, I think he was the greatest. He became King of Cuba in 1630, and during a relatively short period of 10 years, he set in motion an economic development that was transformed the nation and gave it a new forward direction. He was not only far ahead of his own time in perceiving that economic development was the only way to restore the ancient greatness of the blacks, but he is still ahead of, his whole, of the whole black world today in the revival of economic activities on all possible fronts. The economy had remained on a subsistence level, it could hardly be otherwise because the nation was still in its formative stage, still very young. The main activities were still in the fields of agriculture, fishing, weaving, mat making, basketry, wood carving, carpentry, furniture making, pottery, iron and copper smithing, sculpture and painting. There was a remarkable advance in all the arts, especially the pictorial arts, since it was from the latter that the blacks developed their writing system in earlier times and had lost it through migrations. One may wonder either whether there was any rediscovery of revival of writing in Cuba, oral history does not tell us or does it. We do not know. What we do know is that the kind of stable society and institutions were developing in this nation, from which writing develops as a compelling and almost indispensable need. Chayam's economic revolution stimulated many facts and facets of the national renaissance, about which we, know, we now know very little. But the revolution of 1630 was a revolution in thinking, in search for new and better ways of doing things. The new king was interested in new styles and a break from the traditional arts forms. His drive was for national consolidation and internal development rather than the wars of conquest that so many occupied the time and energies of his predecessors. The slowly developing economy now experienced a sense of urgency and national direction. New crops were introduced, sorghum, corn, millet, not entirely new to the region, the area, tobacco, yams, and beans. The external influence here was black. External influence and now hardly external to Cuba because some of the tribes now constituting the nation came from the areas where these crops were grown. Would yams and tobacco grow in Cuba? Let's find out. Shyam seemed to have been saying on all fronts all down the line. The skilled crafts were expanded and methods of production improved and speeded up by new techniques. New weaving and embroidery methods were notable. The break with tradition was most clearly seen in the experiments in new art patterns and new styles in wood carving. 
All this economic activity meant a market, a marked transition from a subsistence to a surplus economy. And this, of course, led to general prosperity through the expansion of markets and foreign trade. Since Cuba was not within the orbit of the caravan routes of international commerce, her foreign trade was with the African, with other African areas. Cuban uh, trade missions were sent near and far to promote trade through the establishment of markets at important trading centers in nearby and distant states. This was the most important aspect of Shyam's economic revolution. In the decline of the civilization of the blacks as they splintered off and scattered here and there over Africa and over the world, they lost this pioneering spirit of business enterprise, the most economic urgent need in recapturing their lost status in the, in the modern world of aggressive competition. The traders were also organized in the societies. Every occupation except agriculture had a society or guild. Farmers were not so organized because just about everybody was a farmer in addition to his trade. Any townsman who did not have a farm somewhere would have been considered strange. One's trade or profession then was seen as possible only because of the basic economy and the reason for everybody was responsible for a share in agricultural production. The general prosperity engendered by the economic revolution did not bring general internal peace. The inevitable increase in population was further expanded by the annexation of new territories and the influx of the endless stream of migrating people who were attracted to this new land of opportunity. But they were strangers, and this fact, as noted above, was a cause of unrest among them, and even greater unrest among the conquered groups. It appears that the national prosperity served to heighten the tensions rather than reduce them. More trouble came from being elements in this country. Members of a major tribe that had challenged the Bashung leaders even before the move from Mayul. Rebellions also broke out just before Shyam assumed their leadership. The Piang and Kete succeeded in capturing and destroying the capital city, while the, sub the unsubdued Bain continued their attacks from the area still under control. These internal conflicts were of great historical importance because of the far-reaching consequences. The most important overall outcome was radical changes in the traditional constitution. To begin with, religion was drawn up in upon was drawn upon as an indirect means of social control by enchanting the divine role of a king the traditional role of the king was the chief elder and therefore the chief representative of the people before god was very easily changed now to the conception of the king as the lieutenant of god on earth as god's lieutenant on earth the king could assume power not recognized by the constitution and go unchallenged but above and beyond this, the internal turmoil was regarded as such a threat to the nation's existence by the loyal chiefs and the people that had even more powers than the king had dared to assume and were bestowed upon him to enable him to crush rebellions by direct action and restore internal peace. Here, then, is how democracy may become an absolute monarchy, not by coup d'etat, but by the con constant and by the consent of the people themselves. They seem to be thinking only about the others, strangers causing trouble, when they allow the council to give the king the power over life and death. Another fatal blow to the African democratic system was allowing the king to raise and maintain his own national army. The national army, as we know, had always been made up of contingents under the supreme command of the council operating through the respective paramount chiefs and provincial kings. This single change can be said to have been completed have completed the triumph of the king of Cuba as an absolute monarch. He had already acquired extraordinary powers quite naturally as the kingdom expanded over new territory. New administrative officers had to be made. Some of these were so important that the king encountered no open opposition when he also appointed them as members of the hitherto ex exclusive state council. This marked end of the traditional council as it functioned under the African constitution. The core council of the 18 elector states was now outnumbered by the appointees of the king. It appears that Cheyenne made no display and very little use of the new powers of the elector chiefs. His chief interest in, continued to be in the field of internal improvement, building a capital city and upgrading the social amenities that reflect a highly advanced society. These included new forms of court etiquette and procedures, resplendent, resplendent regalia, etc. 
One of Cheyenne's stratagems for securing the loyalty of the support of important chiefs and other notables was the appointment of the sons to many important posts. This move was significant because it bypassed the nephews and favors of the sons, thus satisfying the nat natural but never a spoken desire of most fathers in a matrilineal society. The King General Siam left a record of achievements that none of his successors could match. He was a legend even in his own time, lifetime. The people had never known or heard about such a leader and had never experienced in their own lives the direct benefits of such leadership. It had to be magic, and therefore Siam had been a great magician. Since magic in Africa was a, simply another religious means of invoking the aid of a deity to call the chief intercessor with God a magician meant that he was actually securing benefits for the people and that he was indeed the lieutenant of God on earth. In short, magic was another form of prayer, song, or dance in the appeals to supernatural powers for help. Mbung Aling, Xiam's successor, was not a great magician. He was a warrior king, a great general. He did not have to carry on the economic revolution. It carried on itself from the momentum Xiam had given it. Mbung Aling devoted himself to further wars of conquest and the expansion of the royal power which these wars made easy. The age-grade military system started by Shyam was expanded from a militia to a strong standing army, strong for the period. Prisoners of war, now slaves, formed the king's personal army. They were stationed in separate villages of the town of their own. Now the king was powerful enough to attempt to make the modest changes in the matrilineal system under Shyam, more thoroughgoing and permanent in the royal family itself. The royal nephews were all placed under permanent house arrest, and sons of kings became heirs to the throne. Meanwhile, they were appointed to an important government posts in, in different parts of the kingdom. And while it has been suggested that this radical breach of constitutional law was intended to reduce the, fa the factional power struggles in the royal family, what it did was to sharpen such struggles along more clearly defined lines. Mabun had divided not only the royal, but all the chiefs and the people and the defenders of the traditional constitution on the one hand and the progressive reformers on the other. This meant more unrest and more rebellions. The king general dealt with these with an iron hand, was successful and proceeded with from another important assault on the constitution. He outlawed migrations from the country. This had been one of the black man's greatest freedoms, the right of every dissatisfied individual or group to withdraw from the community, migrate elsewhere, and either join some other group or set up a new chiefdom. The universal use of this freedom, let it be remembered at every point, is one of the reasons for so many different little societies and language groups throughout the continent, while at the same time indicating a common origin and background. This relatively small and generally unknown kingdom of the Congo region was a microcosm of black Africa in other respects and as in other African states it presents the concrete evidence and special validation of such of much of the history of the black people. There was still another development of the highest importance for ethnologists but one which they generally bypassed or treat very lightly. This had to do with still another way well, another way new tribes chief, new chiefdoms and new language groups were formed ultimately leaving not a trace of what the respective members of such groups had been in former times. A new tribe and chiefdom of this kind was formed by strays and stragglers, individuals and in very small groups that had become detached from their main society during the migration. Speaking different languages and dialects, there were unaffiliated persons who were lost in the corporate society of Cuba. Even to become second-class citizens as newcomers, strangers had to be members of a single large group a single group large enough to have the traditional tribal socio-political structure headed by a chief. Because of these conditions and circumstances, many stray individuals and small groups from different tribes united and began the formation of a new tribe, a new language from the merger of many, and a new tradition of or oral history. Here too is how and why oral tradition may become confused and misleading during the first two or three generations. For the first chief and his family, chosen as founders of the new chiefdom, may attempt to overplay their role in the founding and progress of the new society. The central point that is stressed here again, however, is that the historical process in Africa and segmentation, remerging segmentation and remerging ad infinitum, defies all attempts by Western anthropologists to divide and classify the race by opposing ethnic societies. It cannot be done either by linguistic 
or by conclusion, by conclusions arrived at one of the basis of widely different physical features and or characteristics. All of these observations can be drawn from the most eventful 50 years in the history of Cuba from 1630 to 1680. Notwithstanding the unprecedented changes in the constitution, ironically enough, the periods of Cuba's glory and greatest achievements were under the leadership of the, her three great auto, autocratic kings, Shyam the Great, Mabung Aling, and Mabu Mabush, 1650-1680. With the death of Mabu Mabush, an era of relative peace, stability, and progress came to an end. But that era left us with perplexing question. Considering the history of the nation before Shyam and after Mabush, the question is whether democracy actually served the welfare of the people as well as auto, uh, autocracy. It is an awful question, but here in a specific case where the question rises under its own power, in view of the record, no one has to raise it. It therefore has to be faced. It may be the traditional bound, tradition bound councils which we glorify so much because they represented the people and served as a check on chiefs and kings. We also have check, served to check progress under the leadership of dedicated kings, chiefs and kings of far seeing vision. This in turn introduced the question of the role of leadership in the affairs of men and particularly in the history of every people that had great leaders who lit the blaze which banished the darkness from the marching paths. Since leadership is indispensable in any group situation, large or small, the ultimate solution in a democracy may be centered among and around the question not of how much power a leader has, but rather in whose interest and whose welfare the power is to be used. This presupposes an alert people who know when and where to draw the line between their welfare and actions of a powerful leader. When Mboum went to the extreme by appointing and disposing chiefs at his pleasure, the people could have checked him. Therefore, the great king who did, not, who did so much to build a strong nation has planted the seed for its destruction with, from within long before the Europeans completed its destruction from without. From 1680 until the coming of the Europeans in the 1800s, intermittent and internal strife darkened the whole period. The struggle centered around the various constitutional violations and changes. These were the main issues, whether the rebellions were led by whole tribes or were civil strife led by royal sons on the one hand and royal nephews on the other. Through it all, however, foreign and domestic trade somehow continued to flourish. In fact, Cuban markets were so widespread outside of the country that these enterprising blacks attracted the attention of the now world, world conquering Europeans. They now had business to explore up and down the Kasai and Sakura rivers, checking on the operations of the Bakuba. Once again, the most crucial points in the history of the blacks were be being epitomized by a single small nation. It was to escape the Europeans that centuries before the people who had formed the Cuban state had continued their migrations from the Atlantic seaboard and journeyed far into the interior. They had come along, come on and along the same rivers that advanced scouts of the enemy were now exploring. The blacks, as usual, were too busy fighting among themselves to mar mark the heralds of their own doom and see the significance of their coming. Up to this time, they had been wise enough to adhere to the rule followed by most African states by rigidly barring all non-Africans from crossing their borders. The record of over 4,000 years showed that in each and every case there were rulers where the rule of exclusion was relaxed and Asians and Europeans were admitted under whatever pretext, the ultimate fate of the blacks was sealed. First, a lone Portuguese man seeking trade who would be silly enough to fear a lone white man. And were not the Cubans the great traders along always looking for new markets, nor were the few Germans who came later any occasion for concern other than the new opportunities for trade. The exploring expeditions up and down the rivers did not cause alarm. Trading relations with the Europeans were indeed established and were becoming more and more profitable. The Europeans were not yet permitted to settle within the country, but no matter. They were, as we have said, long-range schemers. The pattern of worldwide imperialism had been determined long ago, and the techniques of penetration and dominance were fixed and universally applied. So, instead of invading the country by force, something they were never prepared to do initially anyway, they rigged, they ringed the country with trading posts along its borders. To these outports, Missionaries assembled to form missions for God and the empire, and were later followed by armed detachments, ostensibly to protect the trading routes and new markets from imaginary raiders. To make matters worse, the European crisis began to develop near the end of the longest and most strife-driven reign in Cuban history. 
King Mbop Amabuk Mahamabu was in the fifth decade of his rule, tired and worn out both by age and endless fighting. Far from seeing the gathering Europeans as a threat, he and his immediate successors seemed to have regarded them as a godsend that would solve two critical problems. The Portuguese offered to buy all the captured rebels and other troublemakers and replenishing of a drained treasury by the sale of these war prisoners. The first tend to end civil strife and restore domestic peace, and the second was a new source of great wealth. To be relieved of the cost and trouble of maintaining prisoner of war camps was still another incentive for selling them. For such reasons, and the unforgivable sale of blacks into slavery by blacks began. The fact that African chiefs and kings had a quite different conception of slavery than the Caucasians does not excuse them, for in the course of time they had to know that in the West the captured blacks became slaves in fact, and not as in Africa, persons who became members of the community, were integrated into families, became members of any crafts, had rights to farmland, held offices, and in fact, had all the rights and privileges enjoyed by their original captors. So I'm saying that first that while at first the African slave sellers may not have known the fate to which they were consigning their brothers, in time they did learn. And for this reason, blacks will stand condemned forever before the bar of history, King Mabu Abul along with the others. The sale of malcontents into slavery did not end the civil strife because, for one thing, all the rebels were neither captured nor defeated. Besides, the permanent center of conflict was in the royal lineage itself. The general upheaval after 1885 and the year of the European conquest of all Africa began, made it easy for the whites to enter and spread all over the country. The traders of missionaries were the first to take over the country, and the first by allying themselves with opposing chiefdoms and, opp and opposing royal factions, urging on each to keep up the fight until against the others. Indeed, the missionaries in Cuba were missionaries of damnation, not salvation. They wore the deceptive garb of religion, but their activities were not only almost wholly political, but they were concerned with the furthering, the disintegrating and collapse of this little black nation. They obviously did not come to help, spiritually or otherwise. They came to hinder, at least until the country was completely under white rule. Their next step, therefore, was to actually set up chiefdoms themselves, install puppet chiefs, and rule the country through the chiefdoms for which they and traders had control. When the 20th century dawned, the dying Cuba was gasping for breath, making its last desperate attempts to free itself from the choking hands through which it had to bestow Christian blessings. But it was too late. The temporary restoration of the king was too late. The Congo Free State's gesture of assistance was too late. Death arrived according to a schedule, and that was determined by the whites. In 1916, the European-controlled Cotape, the last to hold the fictitious title of king to disguise white rule, passed from the scene, and the kingdom of Cuba, having long since died, now had its death certified by the equally small state of Belgium that now ruled the black African region ten times its size. Cuba was the African experience in so many important respects that it was taken as case study typical of that experience. We have therefore seen how many of the migrations ended after the people had been uprooted from one place after another. Those who went to the farthest regions found that they believed to be a place of refuge and began to build again as a separate isolated society, slowly developing new forms of speech and variations from the original culture. Others found refuge in swamps, caves, forests, deserts, where the natural environment alone was an effective barrier to progress to progress and the unspoken command to retrogress to, pro to barbarism. Still others, such as the Bashums, united with other tribes to form a new nation. Out of this new nation, there emerged not only a new people composed of many diverse groups, but also new language similarity made up of different languages and dialects. It was also significant that the new state was formed under the guidelines of traditional African constitution. Kings were to be elected, and the power center was the council of the state. There appeared to be a studied program of na nation building by glorifying the unique cultural offerings of which society and making its contributions is part of the whole nation's heritage. Significant, too, was the fact that religion, like other basic institutions, was essentially the same as it was in the heartland of the race. The sky god was still the sun god, and the sun was simply the obvious way to symbolize the reality of the one god concept, the creator of the universe. The whole and the role of the great leaders as benefactors in human affairs was repeated and made clear again in the life and work of Shyam the Great, and in that of at least two of his successors. 
Shyam's economic revolution that promoted remarkable progress and prosperity made his new title of Lieutenant of God on Earth readily acceptable. For were not to those leaders who looked after the welfare of the people the instruments of the divine will? As we have seen, the political phenomenon develops from a circumstance in which the, other, the people's confidence in the leader is so great that he may be allowed to exercise powers unlimited to further advance the public welfare. It is a genesis of absolutism. Therefore, the study of the state was also a study of how an African democracy evolved into an autocracy without an external influence whatsoever. Kuba revealed something else. We also saw that there was a black imperialism in Africa, all Africa, and without outside influence. Indeed, we saw the microcosm of, of all the conquests of blacks by blacks, the oppression and enslavement of blacks by blacks, all of which left us to the heritage of suspicion, distrust, and hatred that accounts for tribalism, disunity, fear, and unrest today. In spite of it all, the Cuban state was relatively secure as a black power entity until they allowed the whites to come in. At that point, the history of the blacks in Egypt and everywhere else was being repeated in an exactly the same way. The blacks had learned nothing from their previous experiences with the whites. The blacks were therefore doomed to repeat the same big mistake over and over, meanwhile losing both their civilization and their freedom. As the last days of the kingdom show, the separatist chiefdoms struggling for power actually sought alliances with the whites to overcome this or that black faction. They did this in Egypt and lost. There, they continued to form alliances with the whites against blacks even after black rule had been pushed southward under the first cataract. The whites were only too anxious to oblige and thus helping the blacks to speed up the work in which they were so busily engaged. Social disorganization and in internecine strife that led to the white control of their lives. One may wonder if Kotape, the last of the figureheads kings under Belgium role, ever reflected on how and why the blacks so often seal their own doom.